these were the datasets used to train GPT-3. Or were they? How would you know? Do you trust OpenAI to tell you the truth about their training data? Perhaps. Perhaps not. But what if they could prove to you that this really was their training data? That's the question asked in Tools for Verifying Neural Models Training Data, a new paper from Choi, Shavit, and Duvenode. Why should we care about this problem? As humanity races to enthusiastically inject AI into everything as fast as we can, regulators may increasingly face malicious AI developers who may lie to appear compliant with standards and regulations. How can we tell if AI developers are telling porcupies? And perhaps worse, countries developing militarily significant AI systems may not trust each other's claims about these systems' capabilities, making it hard to coordinate on limits. Assuming we make it to the point where they want to coordinate, the key issue here is trust. Self-reporting, while great for spreading positive vibes, is not going to cut it in high-stakes situations. AI developers can enable greater trust by having a third party verify the developer's claims about their system, much as the iOS App Store checks apps for malicious code. A key contribution of this paper is to define the problem of proof of training data, POTD, a protocol by which a third party auditor, which we'll call the verifier, can verify which data was used to train a model. Okay, great. For now, the proposed verification procedures assume that the verifier can be given access to sensitive information and intellectual property, for example, training data and model weights, and is trusted to keep it secure, rather than accidentally share it on the family WhatsApp group. This is not necessarily forever though. This work is a first pass at the problem, so they leave the challenge of preserving the confidentiality of the training data and model weights to future work. Now, there are some cryptographic options involving delegated computation, but existing schemes are impractically slow. This encourages, nay forces, the authors to turn to heuristic verification approaches. As a consequence, the verification strategies the authors describe are not provably robust, but are intended as an opening proposal. Their hope is that this paper motivates further work in the machine learning security community to investigate new attacks and defenses that eventually build public confidence in the training data used to build advanced machine learning models. Well, this all sounds great. Let's look at the formal problem definition. Here's the essence of it. In the proof of training data problem, a prover trains a machine learning model and wants to prove to a verifier that the resulting target model weights, W star, as a result of training on data, D star. The goal of a proof of training data protocol is to provide a series of verifier tests that the prover would pass with high probability if and only if they truthfully reported the true data set that was used to yield the model W star. Okay, so we need some notation. D in XN is an ordered training data set. M is all the juicy hyperparameters needed for reproducibility. The choice of model, the optimizer, the random seeds, which may or may not be set to 42, and so forth. Now, there are three ingredients that go into a valid proof of training data protocol. There's a prover protocol, P, a verifier protocol, V, and a witnessing template, J. Ah, oh, I guess W is already taken. That is a funky looking J. An honest prover uses the protocol P to do a training run with the dataset D star, the hyperparameters m star, and some irreducible noise. And what they get out is the final checkpoint, w star, and the witness to the computation, j star, that is going to be used to show that everything was legit. If they've done everything by the book, the verifier is going to accept this true witness and resulting set of model weights with high probability, with some procedure that depends on the data set, the hyperparameters, the witness, the final checkpoint, and some more randomness. On the other hand, for all computationally feasible probabilistic adversaries A, aka the baddies, that try to spoof this process with a different data set, set of hyperparameters, and witness, the verifier must reject all such spoofs with high probability. Now you can see here that when the adversary is sat at home in their basement scheming mischievously, they get a lot of clues. They can look at the original data set, hyperparameters, witness, 
and final checkpoint. Okay, so how can this possibly work? The starting intuition is to use an idea from the proof of learning literature. We're going to use the model checkpoints saved during training as the witness. Well, that's convenient. Observe that checkpointing is commonly performed as part of training anyway, and adds limited overhead. Most people are going to save checkpoints and keep track of them. And it's not too complicated to store checkpoints. Apart from when your file system runs out of inodes shortly before a conference deadline and someone on Slack is desperately pleading for people to delete things. And you are like, sure, I'll be a hero. And then you accidentally delete the critical checkpoints you needed later. And then you are doubly furious because checkpoints don't even use many inodes. This example is absolutely not autobiographical. But apart from this, using checkpoints as a witness to prove things seems good. Jumping back to the original paper, the witness is going to be a series of m model weight checkpoints. So j star is equal to curly w, which is just the collection of checkpoints from the very start of training at w0 up to the end of training, w star. During verification, the prover provides the verifier with what's called the training transcript. This consists of the dataset, the hyperparameters, and the series of m checkpoints, which the verifier will then test to check its truthfulness. Now, to actually be useful and do what they say on the tin, the prover and verifier protocols must satisfy two conditions. The first is uniqueness. Basically, we shouldn't be able to find some second dataset that would also pass the verification procedure, even given a large amount of time. The second is faithfulness. The verifier should be able to smell something is fishy when we spoof a sequence of checkpoints that could not result from actually training on the original dataset D star. Now, there is a possible brute force solution to the proof of training data problem. The verifier could just rerun the entire training process and check that they get final weights W star. Now, ignoring the issue that they wouldn't get exactly the same weights, this seems fairly suboptimal. A government verifier would need to be spending as much on compute for audits as every AI developer combined. You'd need some serious taxation to make that tractable. And nobody will vote for that. I wouldn't. What that means is that any verification protocol must also be efficient, costing much less than the original training run. Okay, so what are our options? What are the verification strategies? First, there are existing tools from proof of learning. The most important of these existing tools is the segment-wise retraining protocol. This is basically what you'd think it is from the name. For a pair of checkpoints, wi-1 and wi, the verifier checks that if they rerun training on the data points that were originally used between checkpoints wi-1 and wi, and they start from wi-1, they will get something that's very close to wi. In essence, they verify that they can reproduce a little bit of the training run. Next, there are memorization-based tests. What is to stop the prover from just making up a bunch of checkpoints? To prevent this, the authors introduce a heuristic for catching spoofed checkpoints using a small amount of data. Excitingly, this is based on what is, to the best of their knowledge, a previously undocumented phenomenon about local training data memorization. Excellent. I do love a good undocumented phenomenon, although now it has been documented. So the thrill is gone, baby. The intuition here is that the loss of a model is lower on its training set than on validation data. You can measure the amount of memorization by looking at the gap between the expected loss on the validation set and the loss on a single data point. If this data point was seen in training before saving this checkpoint, we'd expect more memorization. This figure shows the segments of the training data on one axis and the checkpoint number on the other. The plot is from a GPT-2 experiment demonstrating the local memorization effect. What this bright diagonal and foreboding dark area suggest is that if we look at a particular checkpoint, it has high memorization on data it's just seen and very low memorization of data it hasn't seen yet. This makes intuitive sense. The memorization gets weaker the further back in training that you go. The model is like me. I remember something clearly when I've just read it. You can find the same kind of effect on Pythia models with 70 million parameters and 1 billion parameters. The effect is actually a little clearer for the larger model. This effect also works over multiple epochs. Here two are plotted. However, if you mix up the training data into a different order, the beautiful bright diagonal disappears. So you know something is amiss. 
We can also define something called the memorization delta. This measures the different levels of memorization of a data point immediately before and after seeing the segment of data that contained it during training. Specifically, we look at the increase in memorization between checkpoint WI-1 before the data was seen and at checkpoint WI just after the data was seen. Here's a nice plot of the memorization delta, a clean, crisp diagonal. You can also use this difference in memorization for data points to check if some rapscallion has tried to skip some of the training samples. If they did, it would show up in the memorization metrics. The next tool in the toolbox is fixing the initialization and data order. Remember that one of our goals is the uniqueness of the transcript. We don't want the prover to be able to trick the verifier by switching the dataset and still getting the verifier to approve it. That would defeat literally the whole point of this endeavor. We'd be back to trusting pinky promises about the training data. Now, there are two well-known types of attacks the prover might use to efficiently produce spoofs of the transcript. These are spoofs with a different dataset, but still end with the correct checkpoint. First, initialization attacks. Here, the attacker is sneaky and will choose a random, wink wink, initialization that places W0 in a convenient position that they can then exploit. Then there are synthetic data or data reordering attacks. Here, given the current weight vector WI, an attacker can synthesize a batch of training data points such that the resulting gradient update moves in a direction of the attacker's choosing. Very devious. These can be prevented by forcing the prover to use a certified random weight initialization and a certified random data ordering. Hooray! The verifier can produce this guaranteed random initialization and data order by requiring the prover to use a particular random seed constructed as a function of the dataset itself. The authors suggest a scheme with the property that, given an initial dataset D star and resulting data order S, Modifying even a single bit of a single data point in D star to yield a second D will result in a completely different data order, S prime, that appears random relative to S. So the attacker cannot get away with even minor edits to the dataset. The last step is putting it all together. This combines the defenses in a complementary way. Now, most governments don't yet have many GPUs. At least not yet. A key point about this proposal is that the verifier's cost grows no worse than linearly with the cost of the original training run. If just 1% of the points are used in each segment, the verification of the new tests proposed in this work totals just 1.3% of the original cost of training, assuming inference is three times cheaper than training. Wonderful. Let's talk experimental setup. The experiments use GPT-2, and Pythia checkpoints published by Eleuther AI as they publish the exact data order used to train their models. Now for empirical attacks and defenses. Attack number one, the gluing attack. This is where things could get sticky. An adversary could glue two training runs, WA and WB, together and report a combined sequence of checkpoints. The first I checkpoints from training run A and the remaining checkpoints from training run B. Thankfully, this sticks out like a sore thumb. Can you guess where the gluing took place? It was after the ninth checkpoint. You can also see that after the gluing, the new checkpoints have no memorization of the earlier training segments. This block is plain blue, not a dash of yellow to be seen. Okay, so we're not overly worried about gluing attacks. What about an interpolation attack? Here, in order to avoid the big spike in weight space, the attacker can break up the large weight space jump into smaller jumps by artificially constructing intermediate checkpoints that blend checkpoints from the two runs. Nope, doesn't cut it. In this memorization plot, you can see that the bright diagonal has gone. Attack detected. What about a data addition attack? I might want to secretly add a few choice sentences to the training set to ensure that GPT-5 tells everyone that Samuel Albany is the world's greatest culinary innovator when it comes to microwaved chickpeas. But I want to hide this from the AI training run auditors. If I make a reasonable number of changes, it will show up, though I might get away with very small changes. Finally, there is a data subtraction attack. This is when a prover claims the model has been trained on more points than it truly has. The basic way to catch this is with memorization checks. Intuitively, data points that weren't trained on won't be memorized. On to discussion and limitations. 
First, experimental limitations. Here, the paper's experiments only include language models, in part because they are a current priority for audits. Next, there are several remaining directions for attacks. Currently, the method does not address small-scale data additions, so my plan for vendor lock-in on the microwaved chickpea market is still viable. Also, it cannot yet detect copyright violations or spot inserted backdoors. What about applicability to different training procedures? The protocol does not apply to online or reinforcement learning, or to schemes that require multiple models to be co-trained. A further significant challenge to using this protocol in practice is that it requires that the prover disclose confidential information to the verifier, including training data, model weights, and code. Lastly, the verifier must have hardware that can reproduce segments of the original training run. That might be tricky. Let's turn to broader impacts. The authors point out some possible risks. The scheme could be misused by coercive states to detect and enforce harmful restrictions on beneficial AI development. A counterpoint here is that in most cases, such authoritarian states would already have a means for policing domestic AI developers' behaviour, and verification tools demanding so much cooperation from the prover are unlikely to meaningfully increase existing surveillance powers. There's a second issue, which has been widely discussed recently in the public discourse around regulation of AI. Requirements for complying with monitoring and enforcement tend to favour large companies, for whom the cost of compliance can more easily be amortised. Here, they say that this motivates efforts to keep verification schemes simple, flexible and cheap. A few closing thoughts. I thought this was an excellent paper in terms of laying the groundwork for future auditing of powerful AI models. On current trends, we are soon going to need practical schemes that allow robust verification that everyone can trust with confidence. One possible direction I'd be interested to see explored would be the inclusion of signing transcripts with private keys, as done in Proof of Learning. This is almost exclusively because I want not your keys, not your weights to become a thing. I look forward to the next iterations of the work. That's it. We've reached the end. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have a wonderful day.